What happens when you take the imaginary unit I and raise it to the power of itself? At first glance, this seems like mathematical nonsense, but as we'll see, the answer is not only meaningful, it's surprisingly concrete. To tackle this problem, we need one of the most beautiful connections in all of mathematics. Euler's formula. e to the power of i theta equals cosine theta plus i times sine theta. This elegant equation bridges the exponential function with trigonometry, describing every point on the unit circle in the complex plane. Let's visualize this on the complex plane. We have a horizontal real axis and a vertical imaginary axis. Euler's formula describes any point on this unit circle which has a radius of 1. For any angle theta, the point on the circle is given by e to the i theta. Its projection on the real axis is cosine theta, and its projection on the imaginary axis is i sine theta. Step 1. We need to express i itself using Euler's formula. We're looking for an angle theta such that cosine theta plus i sine theta equals i, since i has a real part of 0 and an imaginary part of 1. U, we need cosine theta to be 0, and so we substitute pi over 2 for theta. Cosine of pi over 2 is 0, and sine of pi over 2 is 1. This expression now matches the right side of Euler's formula perfectly, which means that we can write i as e to the power of i times pi over 2. But here's the thing. We can add any multiple of 2 pi to our angle and still land on the same point. Full rotations don't change where we end up, so the general form includes these extra rotations, where k is any integer. This multiplicity turns out to be crucial for what comes next. Step 2. Now, you might think we can just use normal exponent rules, but complex exponentiation requires a more careful definition. For complex numbers, z to the power w is defined as e to the power of w times the natural log of z. Since the complex logarithm can have infinitely many values, the result isn't just one number, it's an infinite set. Applying this definition, i to the i becomes e to the power of i times the natural log of i. Our next move is to figure out what the natural log of i is. We already have an exponential form for i, so let's substitute that in. We replace i inside the logarithm with its general exponential form. But hold on, we can't just cancel the log and the exponential. In the complex world, the logarithm is multi-valued. The log of e to the z is z, plus any integer multiple of 2 pi i. However, because our formula for i already includes the 2 pi k term, it cleverly contains all the possible values. So in this specific case, we can proceed with the cancellation. So the logarithm and the exponential cancel out, leaving just the exponent. This simplifies beautifully. Now, look what we have in the exponent. We have i times i. This is the moment where the imaginary world connects back to the real one, which gives us i squared. And by definition, i squared equals negative 1. Substitute negative 1 and something remarkable happens. All the imaginary units have vanished from the exponent. Let's distribute that negative one across the terms inside the parenthesis. And cleaning it up, we get our final general form. What we're left with is e to a purely real exponent. An imaginary number raised to an imaginary power gives us real numbers. Not just one, but infinitely many positive real numbers. Among this infinite family of answers, there's one that mathematicians typically single out as the principal value. This comes from choosing the principal argument of a complex number to lie between negative pi and pi. For i, this corresponds to setting k equal to zero. Starting with our general form, let's see what happens when k equals zero. We substitute zero for k. Two pi times zero is just zero so that entire term disappears, leaving us with negative pi over 2. So the principal value is e to the power of negative pi over 2, which, numerically, is approximately 0 
a perfectly concrete real number. But this is where the story gets truly mind-bending. This isn't the only answer. Because our general form depends on the integer k, we have an infinite family of solutions. Let's see what some of the others look like. When k equals 1, we get e to the negative 5 pi over 2, which is a tiny number, approximately 0 0.000388. When k equals negative 1, we get e to the positive 3 pi over 2, which is a much larger number, approximately 111.32. But can we be sure? Let's perform a sanity check. If we take our principal value and raise it to the power of 1 over i, we should get back to i. This is what we need to verify. First, let's simplify that exponent. What is 1 over i? We can multiply by i over i, which is just 1. This gives us i over i squared. And since i squared is negative 1, we get i over negative 1. So 1 over i is simply negative i. Let's substitute that back in. Now we can use the power rule and multiply the exponents. We have negative pi over 2 times negative i. The negatives cancel, and we're left with e to the power of i pi over 2. And what is this? From the very beginning of our derivation, we know this is just another way of writing i using Euler's formula. And there we have it i equals i. The sanity check passes, confirming our principal value is correct. Everything checks out. So there you have it. The imaginary unit raised to itself doesn't dissolve into meaninglessness. Instead, it crystallizes into a very real, very specific number. That's the kind of unexpected beauty that makes complex analysis so compelling. Thanks for watching. If you found this exploration of complex exponentiation interesting, consider giving the video a like and subscribe if you'd like to see more mathematical deep dives like this one.